Really, I didn't want anybody poking at me. I wanted to curl up. And now I'm delighted to welcome artist, and I suppose you should say kind of Irish rock and roll legend as well, Gogi. Hi, Gogi. How you doing, Brendan? And, and Gogi, your latest exhibition is entitled Time, and I do want to talk to you about that in a minute. But um, but listen, your own time was really up there a few months ago. So you had a, a bit of a wallop, I suppose. What was the first thing you noticed? How did it start? It presented itself through what uh, was a new word to me, a thunderclap headache. It was the strangest sensation. I mean, you know, I have for a number of years suffered from migraines. This was the strangest sensation. It started right at the top of your head and you could feel it going down through your head. It didn't stop. It kept going down into your neck, down to the base of your neck stopped and then continued with each butt of your ass and down the back of your legs. And I just knew this is weird. This is not right. This is not a migraine. This is something really funky. Yeah. So but being being a man, you didn't get medical attention straight away. Like <laughs> There's well, something terrible happening here. I won't <laughs> ring the doctor just yet. I don't want to be bothering him. Well, you know something? I mean, you could Google, you know, that word thunderclap, just like it sounds. Um, all I wanted to do was curl up in a ball and try and deal with the pain. But then when I'm dealing with the pain, I was throwing up for about 14 hours. I didn't want people sticking things in me. There's a few old people that live, you know, a couple of old people that live next door and you, their kids would freak out if they saw an ambulance coming. You're thinking of these things, but yeah. really I didn't want anybody poking at me. I wanted to curl up and try and run with this ugly feeling. Um, and that's kind of what I did. Yeah, but but ultimately you did accept you needed medical intervention. You got well, into hospital and, and what, what was the situation then? Were, we, were they looking urgent? Well, you know, my girlfriend actually after the best part of two days, or one and a half days convinced me that I should agree to call an ambulance. So she called an ambulance. I was brought into, you know, they hooked me up, sticking all of this the needles in the backs of my wrists, you know, for the drips and the various things. They put me on a drip right there into the back of the ambulance. They took me to St. Vincent's Hospital. I'm sitting in a waiting room. This was another thing I dreaded. I hate queues. I hate waiting rooms. So I'm sitting in a waiting room and eventually I get called. And OK, you're going to get a CT scan now. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You go down, get the CT scan back in the waiting room with another dozen people, I would say, but socially distanced, properly done. Um, so I'm sitting there and... So you must uh, be thinking then, OK, there seems to be no great urgency here, obviously. Well, obviously. I knew they didn't have the results of the CT scan. So the next thing they come out with the wheelchair, please sit in this. They wheel me into a room. All of a sudden I become a VIP. And I oh, said, OK, okay <laughs> this is brilliant. But there's a cost. You know, they get me. I'm lying on this bed. They're wheeling me around. They wheel me up to this ward. And then the doctor that originally interviewed me and asked me about symptoms and circumstances and all of that, he walks into the ward and I said, so... Uh, any news? Um, yeah, we got your CT scan back. And I said, so what's the story? He said, well, to be honest with you, it's not great. You've had a uh, ruptured aneurysm. There's a bleed on your brain. It's very serious. We're waiting for an ambulance. It's going to take you to Beaumont Hospital and um, they will operate the brain surgery, whatever the yeah. you know, procedure is. That's what was going to happen. And that's, that's, what, that's what happened. OK. And uh, brain surgery, I gather people are sometimes awake. Were you awake for it or where? No, where, where I wasn't awake for it. Yeah. I mean, when I was brought did in, they, I was did brought... Did they cut your head open or, or well, the Well, you know or... what? I didn't know at this point in time what was going to happen. Um, so I was brought in and it wasn't until the next morning. That was Sunday evening. Um, it happened on Friday, late, late Friday night, um, early hours of Saturday morning. So I'm brought in every 10 minutes. What year is it? What day is it? You know, what month is it? What's your name? Every 10 minutes and then every 20 minutes they waken you up. They've got to, because, you know, you can have stroke, you can have, I mean, you lose your mind. Yeah. Um, you can get brain damage and, and it's, it's very high on the list of possibilities. So, so it's a lot of that stuff. And yeah, then, it must have been terrifying, was it? 
You know something, the honest truth was, like if there was a rabid, you know, American pit bull chasing me, I would be terrified. I wasn't even, out of a hundred, I wasn't even one. I wasn't at all afraid. Why? It's very strange. I don't know. I mean, look, a higher power had control of it and I guess I didn't need to be afraid. What I was afraid of was when I had had, you know, a brain hemorrhage, I had a bleed, calling my girlfriend and telling her. I was not looking forward to that um, because I called her and I said, look, you better uh, brace yourself. And then, so, so that was difficult, talking to my son, talking to my mates, which I did on the back of the ambulance going from St. Vincent's to uh, Beaumont. Um, you know what? I mean, it sounds like a brag, but it's just the truth. I was not even fractionally afraid. I wasn't nervous at all. So was it your faith came through for you, do you think? Yeah. You know something? I would have to s suspect that that was the case. Uh, I would have to suspect that. But um, I wasn't afraid of, you know, uh, I kind of was under the impression because we'd been reading up on it when the ambulance was on the way. And I knew there was a very good chance that I wouldn't make it. But I wasn't, that didn't, it, really, it didn't yeah. worry me. What worried me was telling people that it was a very serious situation and that was something I didn't like having to do, you yeah. know. But there's, there's two things can happen, people, I think, sometimes after these kinds of things. One is that you can see with guys that they slightly have the fear a little bit for a while after. You know, you can see it in a guy's eyes after he's had a bang like that where he just becomes a bit more fearful. And then the other thing is guys go off and, you know, have an epiphany, change their whole lives and realise, life's too short, I need to do this, isn't this? Either Look, of those, I'm waiting no. for that to happen. <laughs> I so hoped it would, you know. I mean, in some way, I... Look, there's no doubt about the fact that there is some kind of a depression that follows because you're you actually think, yeah. dealing with a lot of blood in your brain. I was told to stay on my back after the operation. I'm wheeled up, you know, lie on your back, um, don't move too much, do this, do that. And you're kind of just, you know, and... Yeah, I mean, that was difficult, but I just remember when I was being actually wheeled out of the ward, some guy that I hadn't spoken to, I'd heard him talking, some GAA guy, I didn't catch his name, he just said, good luck, he knew where I was going. Yeah. I thanked him for that, you know, you're pushed down these corridors, people heavily masked up, and with COVID, of course, you know, yeah. it's a double up. Push down these long corridors into these, you know, huge lift where a lot of people on a bed can fit, long corridors, and then four people heavily masked up with all sorts of plastics and gloves and all of that um, waiting right outside the theatre the doors of the theatre are open you can see all sorts of apparatus I mean it looked like yeah. rocket science yeah, it, it yeah. kind of is um, and they all stood around me and one of them said okay I mentioned this actually one of them said okay what month is it what, what year what month is it what year is it I said, it's 1996 and it's January. And the four of them just stopped and there was dead silence. And I said, only messing. <laughs> and it was a little bit of the, I don't know if you know the Monty Python smoke too much sketch, but it was one of those moments. They'd never heard the joke. They yeah. cracked yeah, up yeah, laughing. Yeah. I just felt it was my duty to do that. I get wheeled in, you know, um, Sarah Power uh, was the lady that operated on me. She was incredible. The way she explained, she did a beautifully d d sketched little um, picture to explain exactly what was happening. And what she said to me was, look, we're going to go up through your groin. We'll go up, I think, straight through your heart, up into your skull, and we're going to have a look at your brain. We're sending a camera up there. Now, what we need to figure out is, there's a very high chance that we can do this. Um, we can bring it back down and we can send the tools up to plug this hole with titanium pins. People call them coils. She described them as pins. Um, now, the chances are we can do that. If we can't do that, we've got to go through your skull. So you don't know whether you're going to wake up and they've gone through your skull mm. or they haven't. Or you don't know if you're going to wake up, I suppose. Um, but... I woke up and I just remember being wheeled back to the ward and um, and it was a good feeling. Yeah, and you're still groggy. And, and, yeah. and they, I believe the aneurysms, that, that can lie in, in place for ages and then 
it might never burst or then it bursts. It, like, yeah. you, you had been under a bit of stress, hadn't you, and had a lot going on in your life. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. I did. Well, I suppose, look, we all went through COVID, you know, and there were parts of that. I had three exhibitions cancelled last year because of COVID. Um, I'm going through what I would have to describe as not a terribly nice divorce. And I, during that time, I lived in six different places. So, you know, I did have a lot going on. And um, I was told exactly, you know, what you said. Uh, it could have been there for decades and it went when it went um but yeah look you Life know changes like pop doesn't it yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. i mean and, and listen it's interesting that you describe very visually the going into the to the operating theater and everything because you kind of are a, you're a painter obviously but you're visual and like you think i know that a painter is born, really, rather than being made, isn't he? That I it, think that's very it's true. who you are. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about that. You know, uh, painters, and probably artists in general, but certainly painters are born, they're not made. Um, and I, I presume growing up in Ballymun, like, there weren't many other... Uh, fine artists uh, no I mean I was region. told I was told by my teachers in primary school to cop onto myself you can't be a, it wasn't called a painter then an artist was automatically presumed to be a painter yeah. I want to be an artist you know yeah. and she said you can't do that you know basically people like you can't do that kind of thing but you can get a job in the post office maybe um, if you really study hard or otherwise you can be a petrol pump attendant I so clearly remember um, and people have often said to me, I think you were very brave doing that. But actually, you know, I was crap at everything else. And I, it was the only thing I was able to do. So there was no bravery. Um, it was yeah. just, um, I was crap at everything else. You know, I could have been a singer in a band if I was able to sing. And I was a singer in a band. I wouldn't have one of the great voices, though. So I was always going to Yeah, but, and, and in a way, the Virgin Prunes was as much an art project as, of it, as course, it was yeah. rock and roll. Look, my, look contribution, just... my contribution to the Virgin Prunes was, you know, it was performance, makeup, costume. Um, that's what it was. It was very yeah. much a, a painter's, um, you know, offering. I mean... Yeah, and That's and for just for to give people briefly the archaeology of the whole situation for people who don't know it, probably part of the reason that you were able to pursue painting and everything was you had a good group of friends around you who were all of the creative bent as well. You grew up together, and absolutely some some of you became the Virgin Prunes, and then some of you, of course, went on to become you too. Did you did you yeah. always think it would work out that? the way it did that you two were going to be the successful ones in the Virgin Prunes. We actually, be, be, we actually, be the we, got the, we got the cover of Hot Press, which for us at the time <laughs> coming from Cedarwood Road and Ballymun was a very big deal. And we did it before you two. Yeah. But no, it's look, in some way, they knew what they were at. In a weird way, we kind of knew something, but we didn't really know anything. And no, I mean, we really had got to jump on the, you know, embrace that punk movement whereby we've got something to say we don't care if we can sing we don't care if we can play but we're gonna say it and we're gonna drive the message home and you know I was a cross between that extrovert that wanted to scream at people on stage and, and at this very shy little boy that would shake before I went on stage so we, we were yeah. you know it was but no of course um look I grew up with the lead singer of U2 um I knew Bono was going to do something very special when we were children. I knew that. Um, there was never any doubt in my mind about that. Uh, so, no, I did not think that uh, the Virgin Bruins were going to become huge. And, you know, we didn't play that card. I mean, we didn't try and write hit songs. We just expressed ourselves. I saw the Virgin Bruins music as a soundtrack to the performance. And that's yeah. what I was excited about. Yeah, you know. and there's there's an interesting then overlay on the growing up as well, and you, you know you referenced your your kind of surrender there. Yeah, go go get the water there. Yeah, uh, when when you were in the operating theater and stuff, and you're kind of being okay with it and the higher power and all that. So, I I've never quite understood the the religion thing with you. It was kind of battered into you in a very Old Testament way, but actually, and most people would go. OK, uh, enough of that. But you actually embraced it and you st and you still have that faith, even though it sounds like 
your your father wasn't it particularly sure yeah kind of really forced it on you and it, and it was quite an extreme faith wasn't it was it, it was Plymouth Brethren is that what the <clears throat> you know they the refer to called? themselves <clears throat> as Christian Brethren Plymouth Brethren. I think we were teenagers and it wasn't until we started getting slagged on the street that we heard <laughs> the term Plymouth Brethren. Um, but yeah, you know, I suppose you would see it as, I think they would be probably called Puritans, you know. What I liked was, you know, they were interested in getting the message across without the frills. It's not where I brought my children. I brought my boys to um, Grosvenor Road Baptist Church that suited me a lot better. Okay. I felt they were a lot less judgmental. Now, in the Brethren, some of them were very judgmental, but some of them were the most incredible people, you know. But, you know, of course, look, my faith is incredibly important to me. I guess it's the most important thing. But I wouldn't be a great example of a Christian. Um <laughs> because I would get spotted in lilies back in the day. I could get spotted absolutely pretty much anywhere <laughs> to a point. But but uh, look, um, I wouldn't be a great example, but you're in or you're out. And I do have that incredibly strong belief. And my faith is incredibly important to me. I don't know if the brain bleed in some way in itself prepared me not to be afraid, but I really wasn't. Yeah. yeah. But I was afraid of spending more than two weeks in hospital. That freaked me out. Yeah, you know? and presumably you're one of those people who've never really been sick or anything either. So when you no. go in, when you go into that other world, the land of the sick, if you're not used to it, yeah, you kind and of feel you're owned. It's like walking through an airport. You know, once you walk into an airport, once you get through security, somebody owns you. Yeah, yeah. They tell you, you what you, to do, and you, you have to do it anymore. Yeah. Um, and and that that was the way it was. Yeah. yeah. Not much crack. Come here, can I just ask you one other question before we move on? You you mentioned there about that you brought the, the boys up then in to, to a Baptist church. Did they rebel against that? Because obviously we're in a different time now and you'd imagine it's a lot more difficult even now for kids growing up to be strongly religious. No, you know, the Baptist church, I should say I probably brought them to a half a dozen churches before I came across this great really? speaker yeah well because I wanted to find the right place you know I wanted to find something that I could sit through uh, and be interested and not fall asleep um, and try and maybe set some kind of an example of being focused to my boys um, I just found you know there was there was a, uh, the guy there was called John Samuel an incredibly gifted speaker in intellect um, and just gifted and brilliant and um, so is it quite is it quite a for you faith is it quite an, an intellectual thing or is it a like a, no it's not an intellectual thing as it says you know I mean come as a child and yeah. I mean that's but just this guy was so bright and as an adult could explain things to you that you wouldn't have picked up as a child or you may never have heard before so and my boys you know they are bright uh, a lot brighter than me and they could really focus and listen to this guy talking. And they were so unjudgmental. And that's what I wanted. I didn't want yeah. any frills, you know, statues, uh, candles all over the place, smoke being waved. And I didn't want that. I just wanted the message and I wanted it as pure and simple. And yeah. I found what I consider to be the, the the right church for that, and to bring my boys. And yeah, and of course I you could. I I suppose you could see that in your art sometimes too. That it's about bringing the thing down to the to the essence sometime of of the essence of the texture, the structure of the Absolutely, thing. Absolutely. Be yeah. Before yeah. we talk about the, time, the teachings the of Christ. Of, I mean, yeah. is you, you know, is what I wanted them to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, before we talk about time, the current exhibition. There's one other kind of. Um, odd thing that also kind of set you on the on the artistic path and that was the time spent in prison <laughs> yes it wasn't no it was a i didn't uh, i didn't um attack anybody or anything look you know when we were kids we were absolutely passionate about motorcycles myself i've got six brothers you know and five of my brothers and myself six out of seven sons uh, were passionate about motorcycles and I could drive you know maybe a Yamaha 125 with tax and insurance or I could drive a far more powerful four cylinder rocket ship without you know insurance not tax on motorbikes it's pretty cheap back then 
but but insurance was crazy. It was through the roof. Kids yeah. could not afford it. Um, so, I mean, the story was, you know, I got a Suzuki Katana 1100. It was, you know, it was one of the quickest bikes on the road when they come, came out. I got that. I was driving it home the night after I bought it with my brother Andy on the back. And I clocked 122 miles an hour in a, going up Ballymun Road. It was a 30 mile an hour zone. By the way, that was wrong. I know that. I wouldn't do it now, but I was a kid. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and the lights just went orange. And I said, I can make the lights. And then at the last minute, I braked hard. And I stopped. The light went red. 30 seconds after that, a hand came over, switched the, the, the engine off and pulled the key out. And it was two policemen. So I was done. I'm up in court and I said, look, Your Honour, you know, I told those policemen that I know it's a very serious offence. I will get tax. I'll get insurance. I said I would get it that week and I did get it that week and I have it here. I will never do it again. I know it's extremely serious. And I think the judge was about to strike it out. And just before, OK, OK, he warmed to me. And just as I believe he was about to strike it out, he paused and he said, sorry, Garth, has this gentleman got any previous convictions? And the copper said, uh, yes, 14, Your Honour. <laughs> Bang, six months. And 14 convictions for exactly the same thing. Yeah. No insurance. But, but that six months, it sounds like that, that kind of, in a way, helped you develop into realising that art was a viable thing for Well, you look, you know what, be. sorry, I should say I appealed it yeah. and uh, it was reduced to three months. OK. Um, and I was brought out of the courts, uh, handcuffed to a guard, uh, brought across to the Bridewell, locked up there, I think, for seven hours. Then a Black Mariah collected myself and other prisoners, brought us up to Mount Joy Jail. I was brought onto D-Wing. You're stripped off. You're, I mean, the whole thing, just like you see in the movies, yeah. it doesn't feel good. And um, and that was it. And there's a much longer story, and I know yeah. we don't have time, but, but, uh, but it was an experience, you know? Then I was brought to an open prison some days later. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't swap it for anything. I don't want yeah. to do it again, yeah. I, you yeah. know, but, yeah. but, uh, but I've no regrets. I, I, I learned stuff. And, you know? and listen then, uh, so to now and, and to time. And, and of course, like time, time is, it's a fecker, like, isn't it? Time is the thing that yeah. it causes all the pain in life in one yeah. way. And it's so it's hard. It's going to get us, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's going to get us. And, and, and I think this, is, this, this uh, exhibition, no, it's in, it's in Paris. The, the kind of idea of it is what the layers that the, the layers and the decay of time and all that kind yeah, of thing. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, the techniques that I have used for many, many years is building up thin layers of paint and removing some and leaving some. And but I've had this idea for quite a while that I wanted to. There were two things. Well, well one thing that I am very interested in, hence the name time. And it's really what time does to surfaces. Yeah. You know, I moved into a house and there was wallpaper hanging off. It was incredibly damp. I pull the wallpaper off but some other wallpaper comes and bits of plaster come and in fact I'm now looking at four or five and even in one spot maybe six layers and you know this really going back to the very furthest layer away from you you know the first layer that was put on and just what time does to surfaces what time does to objects I have you know collected unwanted objects found objects objects that I would buy in a charity shop Oxfam I've collected these things for years, old water jugs, the old enamel ones. And I had this idea that I wanted to represent these things, what time does to stuff and what time does to surfaces. So I set up in front of these walls, moving into this house, I set up these uh, little, little shelving systems, obviously homemade shelving systems. I place, I'm always after balance, you know. What's going on in the background is huge, but now I'm placing these little jars or these little cups or bowls or jugs, you know, in a way that is visually balanced on these things. So what I do is we photograph it, 
I take the photograph to my fine art printer. He prints it and mounts it. And then I start applying paint. But I should say before I photograph it, I apply paint to some of the objects and some parts of the background. So really what I'm doing... So layers within layers with layers over that. Yeah, yeah. And really what I'm doing is blurring the line between paint and photography. And it's an idea that I've had for quite a few years. And this is the very first time it is shown. It's shown, uh, it opened in Paris in... um, a gallery called 75 Faubourg. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and it's if, in and the 8th district. In yeah. Paris. And if people Opposite want to a see very this historical stuff. hotel called um, the Bristol Hotel. Yeah. And if people want to see it, they can go to Gallery, that's G A L E R I, 75 Faubourg, that's F A U B O U R G dot com. And you can see there's some pictures of some of the work there and everything. Absolutely. It's, it's and, a bit, and it runs until the 30th of July. Okay, excellent. It's a bit, it's a bit reminiscent of, I know someone who is a kind of a, a, a friend of yours and a bit of a mentor in ways is, is Sean Scully. And Absolutely. He did that book of just stone walls. But yeah, to see yeah. the, the la- time and texture and all that stuff, it's so powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, look, yeah. I mean, it's incredible. Look, walls are something that I'm very attracted to also. You know, I built some dry walls in the family home, you know, where we raised the children um, yeah. with granite. Uh, look, walls, when they're beautifully built, the walls in the west of Ireland, of course, is what Sean was particularly interested in. I visited those walls with Sean um, on one occasion and we hung out around those beautiful, you know, fields and down to the coast. But, but, uh, but yeah, walls are, can be so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, listen, w- wonderful to talk to you, Gogi. Thank you, you very too, much. Brendan. Let's take a break. Email brendan at rte.ie.